we actually had a trip booked in in 2020 to Croatia, but um, got canceled. And then, uh, yeah, what can I tell you, folks? We've got. Um, I didn't want to be off for that. We have we have one more. Um, we have one more. Let me just do one thing quick. Awesome. Not so far. Usually, Joyce Shulman is on, and her son and daughter are not from Texas. Mm -hmm. They're also on, so they're not here. So we had, um, yeah, we had. Uh, we, we, we. Um, we know we'll be off in those in those times. So we wanted to, um, we didn't want to be off uh, last week, but it worked out. Uh, and so tonight we're going to do, we might finish a little bit early because next week we want to, um, and here we let it, we're letting in Texas, Gordon. We got yeah. Texas. Yeah. Um, next uh, this week and next week, we're going to finish up Genesis. And so we're going to break up this uh, portion that we're reading today, uh, this last few chapters. We're in the last three chapters, four chapters, 47, 48, 49, and 50. We're, we're going to do like two chapters a week. It's too much to do all tonight. And then uh, we want to, uh, we're not extending it. Because it's actually, it would be really good if we finished it in like four weeks. And then when I'm off in July, that we, we, we then come back. So we're actually going to, we're going to start our next stuff now, which I know everybody is wondering, what are we doing next? What are we doing? We're at the end of Genesis. We are going to start reading Exodus next. So we are going to move moving into Exodus. How far in Exodus are we going to go? See, Mike's already pushing it. So he wants to know how far we're going to go. We're probably going to do the first 23 oh, chapters really? of Exodus. Yeah. We're going to go all the way to the building of the Mishkan, and then we're going to, we're going to move into I the next. We're going to move it. Stop. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mike's being problematic right now. Yeah. He's, uh, yeah, we're going to do the first 23 <laughs> chapters. So we, we've been doing just Genesis since uh, September. So we're going we're gonna to explore Exodus. So we're going from just Genesis to explore Exodus. We have to change the name of, of the class. Listen, I really wish, yes, I really wish we could um, just be in Genesis. Uh, I really do love the book of Genesis uh, so, so much. Um, it, it is fun. And, and the stories, I, yeah. And I miss, like, I, like, when we come back to it, and whenever we do come back to it, we'll come back to it at some point. We always say, you know, uh, we'll return, right? Uh, that's what we say when we finish a book. Um, oh, okay. I, 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 I feel like when I come back to Genesis with fresh eyes, then I'm a different person. And, and, and um, however long it's been since I last, you know, kind of studied it with people, I've definitely, uh, obviously I've forgotten stuff. <laughs> Because <laughs> there's no, there's no, there's no way, there's no way, there's no way that I stop it. There's no way that I can. Uh, there's no way that I, I must obviously be forgetting stuff. But obviously, my perspective on things has changed since the last time. You know, we went through Genesis, and so you know, who knows? Maybe the next, by the next time I go through Genesis, maybe I'll be a grandfather by then. And no, I'm only saying that because we're actually reading over the next couple of weeks, uh, this week and next week, we're going to be reading about what it's like to be a grandparent, to be a generation removed from the kids that you've got in front of you. So that is in, that is in the, this week's portion and next week's portion a little bit, really this week's, the part that we're reading. Uh, and I'm I'm not stalling, but we're, I'm waiting for we're waiting for a, a minute or two while we let some other people that I assume are going to come on. But we're going to start. We're going to start. Joyce, some, Joyce, as, as I said, Joyce we all will be here soon. What? Joy, okay, good. I uh, and as you said that, 
just as you said that. <laughs> Joyce. Hello, Joyce. Welcome to you, Joyce. She's still connecting. I think she probably can hear us, but now we can hear her. Oh, Maybe. hi. I'm here. I got a call just before the class started, and I had to take care of it. You're here. We get to see you. Thank you. I'm here. Ta She's here. <laughs> She's here. She's dancing. Uh, yes. so I was just telling everybody, we are going to read uh, about two chapters today. And then uh, next week, we'll read the last two chapters of Genesis. And then about halfway, I guess that'll be, um, I can't figure it out. But sometime in about two weeks, we're going to start Exodus and we're going to read the, we'll start Exodus. It'll be interesting to do that because um, this weekend, as some people have heard me say already, and you may know, it is Shavuot. So Saturday night is the holiday of receiving the Torah. So it's a good time to begin a new part of the Torah. Um, you know, it's also weird because like right now we're getting into the to the book of Numbers on the weekly Parsha. So if we were reading the, the portion, so we were just finishing up Genesis now at the rate we were going, which is studying it pretty in depth. This week, we're just getting into the book of Numbers. We're reading the beginning of the book of Numbers. So I mean, think about it. We would have read Genesis, Exodus. If we were studying every week, we would have had to read Genesis, Exodus, and all of Leviticus by the time we would have gotten it. We would have had to essentially go three times as fast as we've been going up until now. So there's a lot that you don't see when you go three times as fast. I like to describe it compared to like kind of being in a car. If you're in a car or in a train, you're traveling 75, 100 miles per hour. I guess I don't know how fast trains go now, but... Uh, in China, they go like 200 miles an hour. It's, but anyways, you go 100 miles an hour on a train, you don't see that much. When you're going by on a bike, even if you're going 15, 10 to 15, 20 miles an hour, you see a lot more. You see details, you see things, you pick up things that you didn't see otherwise. Uh, and when you walk, you see even more. <laughs> and so when you walk down the street, you see things on the street, you see people, you see the stores. When you're in the car, you, you, you don't see that, especially when you're driving, you're distracted. And that's what really what happens with the Torah, the Torah study is that we go through at a very fast rate oh, yeah. and we don't see the stuff that we would normally see. So that's why it's important to do what we're doing. And uh, so as we go into Exodus, we're definitely focusing at the, the reason that we're doing this to some extent is we are focusing more on, on the narrative. We're focusing on the story and we we're doing that not just because we like stories. We do. We do like stories. But the stories really, the stories really demand focus. And I think that's because as human beings, we really are people that, are, that, that live and breathe narrative. We live and breathe stories. And for us, you know, to some extent, stories, um, you know, they're our life. And, and you know, we, I, I like to say that we're all living a story. We're all living a Torah that, that we're writing every day with our, with our own, you know, our own lives, the decisions that we make that we're, that we're, um, you know, that we're, uh, we're writing a Torah. We, 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 there's a Torah of our lives and, and why this is important is it kind of connects to Shavuot, this next holiday that we're having. So Saturday night, when we celebrate receiving the Torah, we're doing the, this, this, uh, event in, in conjunction with congregation Beth Shalom as we've done for over 20 years now. What's um, it's our time to host, and I was I was talking with Rabbi uh, Siegel to talk about what we were doing. We wanted to kind of come up with something that was a little bit more interactive, that got people engaged a little bit more, rather than just talking, rabbis talking and teaching, whatever. We thought we'd do something where where everybody was engaged and where everyone was doing a little teaching and a little learning. So we are going to do that this this year. I will tell you, unfortunately. We can't stream what we're going to do because we're actually going to do an activity in person that requires people to be here. It requires people to actually be engaged in in, in storytelling, if you will. So the, I, I don't want to ruin what we're doing because it's not a surprise, but I but it is it does require the buy in for the people who are here. And it's really uh, working on um, on what are our stories? What are what are our stories? What are what are the stories that? What is our Torah? You know, what is our lifetime? Yes, but in a positive way. There's no way that it, there's nothing, there's nothing, there, there's nothing threatening in what you'd be doing. 
I understand, but 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 it's not. He doesn't like to interact. So listen, for those who didn't hear, Mike doesn't like to interact with people. But <laughs> I don't, I don't but, think that's true. What's important? What's important is that this activity that we're going to do really requires people to 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 listen to each other, obviously, but more importantly, to teach and to and to share. And in, in a non-threatening way, because again, sometimes we, we share and we're like, I don't want these people to know, but what we're sharing is actually not, well, I guess it could be personal, but it's not really, it's, it's the kind of information that we wouldn't mind sharing with people. And quite frankly, it's important. It's important for us to at least feel comfortable to share this kind of stuff. <laughs> Stop it. I promise you, it's not threatening. Uh, it's a very, it's a very non-threatening uh, part of, of sharing who we are, which is, I don't know. I don't know where everybody is yet, but we are going to start. I know there's, four, there's, four, there's, four, there's four people. There's other people. I don't know where they are right now. I don't know why there's not sh- there. I think, I think the screen is, I don't know. Joyce, for some reason, we just see you up on the screen. Do you see me? Yeah, but we only I see you. We only see you. That's the thing. Oh, you're not seeing, I see David and Cheryl. I know, it's, it's good that you guys see each other. We don't, we don't. You're uh, not seeing them. You're going to see it in the, yeah. in the room. Yeah, we only see you, Joyce, for some reason. I, it's well, very weird. Here I am. <laughs> you're, I'm going to show everybody what we see right now. Well, while, while I showed, I'm here, I showed, I'll tell I showed you. Gordon, I showed Gordon and Elise what it looks like for us here when we see you. But I'm going to show you. And we're going to go down the loop, the, the whole of. So right now, this is yes, here it is. And just changed it. But right now, we see you guys on that side. I fixed it. On that side. What, what was it doing? Um, you didn't have it set. Um, the view, the little button is just the oh, okay. standard. Gotcha. So it was a setting in there. Anyways, we see everybody now. We see all of you there. Oh, so good. You now. But you, fixed yeah, it. you guys can see us unless you change your view so uh, as long as the view is, is set properly there you get to see it um Good. anyways so we can see you we can see the text uh we just showed you what we see when we see you is that right what we see yeah we see yes. what we see when we see you yeah that's what i was trying to say so <laughs> so we're gonna get started whoever joins in later we'll let them in um Hopefully you can hear, is the mic loud enough there? You can hear us loud yes, enough? Yes, okay. I can hear you very clearly. I'm sure everything was on, maybe too much was on. Uh, so today, last week, or two weeks ago when we read, we were talking about what happens when uh, Jacob and all the rest of the, of the brothers of Joseph are invited, they're invited down to Pharaoh, by Pharaoh to stay, to stay in Egypt. And it says that they, uh, let me get to where... Um, um, where they, where they settle. It says right here, the last part, it says, uh, uh, um, uh, Joseph brought his father, Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh and Jacob greeted the Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? How, how are the years of your life? How many are the years? It's what he says, comma, which means how many are your years? And Jacob's answer is, the years of my sojourn on earth are 130. Few and hard have been the years of my life, nor did they come up to the lifespans of my ancestors during their sojourns. And that's what we finished with, mm-hmm. which was interesting because, again, usually a 130-year-old will say, I've had a long and very meaningful life. Yeah. 30 years. He's not satisfied with that, which I think is kind of a good thing because mm-hmm. as much as we could say, well, shouldn't we be satisfied with a long life and whatever age we're at, where we feel that we've lived a long life. I think it's a great attitude to say, you know what? I'm not done here. And, um, and it is true that his father, uh, Jacob's father, Isaac lived to be 180. So he's maybe as far as he's concerned, Hey, I got 50 more years, maybe. Right. And then his grandfather, Abraham lived to be 175. So I got, I got 45 years left. Now, interestingly, he does not live at, at that long. He lives, he lives for another 27 years. So he's, he's still got another 30 years here on the planet, which is pretty cool. Um, 
but you know, at least up this far, he's he's saying that my years have not been easy, and we know they haven't been easy. Uh, there have been periods of his life. Look, the last thirty years of his life or so, he thought his son uh, Joseph was dead. Right, That's pretty bad. He he got uh, taken advantage of by his by his father in law for twenty years. Laban took advantage of him for twenty years. He, he was thirteen kids. He had thirteen kids that we know of, right? Yeah. Which is which is good, maybe. maybe kids, yeah, okay. But yeah. by the way, maybe 130. That's about 10 years, 10 years per kid. It's interesting, <laughs> by the way. Think about it. It's 130. It's a weird number. It's 10 times one thir- 10 times 13. Yeah. That's interesting. Maybe that's why. I don't know. Anyways, so he's 130, um, and we already came up with a good 50, 60 years or so of that that were not easy. Um, you know, his first 25 years or so as a kid growing up and a young adult, he did not have, obviously, a, it seems a good relationship with his brother. He might not have had a great relationship with his father. He had a good relationship with his mom, but it seems like, he, you know, he has some troubles there. So look, from his perspective, he's had a long life, but it, it hasn't been great. By the way, Pharaoh didn't ask him that. <laughs> Pharaoh didn't say, right. what's your life like? Have you had a happy life? Did you- <laughs> Pharaoh just says, how old are you? <laughs> Jacob, in traditional Jewish fashion, starts to tell him, well, if you want to know the truth, my great grandkids don't call me ever. And I, 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 I've lived for a long time, but you want to know something? My hip needs to be replaced. And I don't want to, you know, uh, anyway, so he, he, he goes on about, about the time. And what's interesting, of course, is that the words that he uses are, my the gur guri my my journey my sojourn which is the way that they translated this and and what's so powerful about it is that he kind of recognizes that this is a sojourn that life is a journey mm-hmm. and, and it's that word that he uses there gur which we already read in this context which is that the israelites are the the, the family it's not they're not israelites yet there's 70 or so people 75 or so people that they are sojourning that they're not living permanently in egypt the same words are used gur and that's by the way in contrast to the word yashav or or yoshvim which means to settle to live to right develop. the word gur has it has the has the word has the um connotation to the word of of sojourning of not being there per, per, permanently of being there like a nomad so basically saying yeah, I'm here for now, but I'm, I'm going to leave, right? I'm here. I live here now, which is interesting, by the way, is if somebody said to you, like, if, if you say, wherever you live, it's just Santa Clarita, since a lot of us are here. If somebody said, if, if you ask somebody and they say, oh, well, where do you live? Well, I live in Santa Clarita now. Just by saying that, the word, uh-huh. now, it implies, number one, you haven't been there for very long. You haven't always been in Santa Clarita or that you're not going to be in Santa Clarita for long. I live in Santa Clarita now seems to imply that either you didn't come from here and you have maybe also an intention of not staying here. Mm -hmm. Interesting thing, just by saying the word now, he says essentially, this is where I'm dwelling or this is where I'm staying. I am staying here. I'm camped here. I am here for the time being. That's what the word gore seems to, uh, to us to give us. So Mary, why don't you give us the King James translation for, for Gore? Pilgrimage. Pilgrimage. That's right. Pilgrimage, which I find to be interesting because that really is a short, a short stay. That's a, that's almost a, a visit, right? That pilgrimage, we'd say, I make a pilgrimage somewhere and then I come back and go home. Uh-huh. Um, I'm not wild about that translation. And I'll tell you why, because at the end of the last line, he says, they're, they, my life is not as long as my ancestors during their sojourns, right? And did they translate it as, as pilgrimage is there? So at least they were consistent with the word pilgrimage. Mm-hmm. I, I don't understand how you can say pilgrimage there because they're talking about their life. And the word you can see is yemei shani, uh, shanei chayecha. Yemei shanei chayai is what it says. Chayai. Here it's my life. And here it's chayai. But you know the word chai means life. So he's clearly not talking about being in a place. He's talking about life. 
And so when he's saying that the years of my life and their sojourns, their journeys, that's not a temporary, that's not a, that's not a, a pilgrimage. That's not a, uh, I went to a place and I visited it. It's, I was in this place and I was, and I was here as a sojourner. But of course, what they're saying here is that your time here on earth is a pilgrimage. I don't like that word, but a, 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 a sojourn. It is a journey here, but it's not the final destination. That is the implication of this, which is a really, really powerful one, which is that our time here in this world, in this existence, is not, the, is not our final destination. But this is our sojourn. I really don't like the word pilgrimage because pilgrimage seems to be like to a place that you really have to go to or you really want to go to or to a holy place. It seems to me like the, the sojourn is actually in the place where you live before you get to the place you really want to get to. And so there is that sense, even though they never say it in here, it's never said, hey, there'll be another place that I get to the next world. It doesn't say that. But it does seem to imply that. It does seem to imply that at least that this existence is only one phase of our existence, that there is another place, there's another existence that we go to that maybe is a final dwelling place or that is the next dwelling place or is the next journey. So that's all possibility here by the word, the journey. And, um, and, I'll give you one example of how reading this this time is different for me than it was the last time I read it. When, when Jacob looks back at his ancestors and he says, my lifetime doesn't match up yet. Maybe he doesn't feel it will. Maybe he knows he's not going to live as long as his ancestors. I mean, maybe he looks at his life. He says, I'm, I'm hundred, whatever. Don't get focused on the 130. Let's say he's 70 whatever he is, he says to himself, here I am at my age. And I remember my dad at my age, he seemed a lot healthier than I did. He definitely seemed a lot happier, he seems to be saying than I did, which is weird. But, you know, whatever it is, he's comparing himself to his ancestors. There's no question about it. He right. says, it's too hard about my life, nor do they come against, right? Like my, my ancestors. And so for me to read this today, after, since the last time I've read Genesis and having lost both of my parents during that time, there definitely is for me now a sense of where is my life going to be in comparison to those who've come before me? Will I live as long as my parents? I think it's natural that we do that. Mm -hmm. Who else are we going to measure our life against? It didn't make sense back then to do it with anybody else. And it definitely doesn't make any sense today. I mean, obviously there's environmental factors for how we live, what areas we live in and what country we live in. All those things have a bearing on how long we live. At the end of the day, our genetics are going to give us our best indication of how we're going to, how long we're going to live. Well, wait a second, folks. Who, who want to say who poor who, you know, I have to tell you when I was born, I had five great grandparents that were in my life when I was born five and I didn't lose I didn't lose one until I was eight so when I, up until I was eight I had five great grandparents I didn't lose my first grandparent until I was 24 really wow. I had four great grand I had four grandparents until I was 24 and I lost my grandfather who I was very close to when I was 24 just before I got married and so you know I thought to myself as a kid I was like uh -huh. I'm gonna live 80 or 90 years no problem maybe by the time they have good medicine you know better medical technology and you know therapies and stuff like that i'm gonna live 100 easy and so that's what i you know i can it's not like i made any calculations going hey i've got to get this done in the next 30 years but it definitely is part of my calculation my parents on the other hand barely cracked 70 and so mm -hmm. what happens is is it completely re i had to i had to reassess things <laughs> and i have to tell you i think it's not like i'm not i don't obsess about it but i do think about it I do think about it a lot. I don't know if I think about it every week, but I think about it. I think I do at least once a week. I do think about m my own mortality a lot more now. And I, and it definitely is because of my parents dying. Anderson's Mexico. 
and definitely since Mexico, definitely there have been things that I've thought about, but really it's been my parents that have had the biggest effect on me. And again, I don't know if other people have felt that most people in this room have, have, have by this point, uh, I know have lost a parent. If not, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's obviously it's inevitable uh, part of, you know, uh, that you're going to lose your parents and grandparents, et cetera. But those losses have an effect on us, not only because uh -huh. we lose the people, but because we start to think of our lives in terms of, of their accomplishments, their age, their, their, who they were. And that's what, that's what Jacob's done. That, that's what he's, what he's just done in talking to the Pharaoh is actually kind of give up a little bit of his own psychology of his own, like his own, his own mind when it comes to his mortality. Mm. So I, I find it a very powerful thing and, and not something that I was alerted to until this, this last pass around. Uh -huh. and, um, and so as, as weird as it is, as I read this, this time, I thought to myself, yeah, I know what Jacob means. I, I know what mm. he's, I know the game that he's playing. And uh, yeah, I'll tell you one other thing that I do. Um, over the last year, I've had the last couple of years, I've had a, a, to do a lot of funerals, and mm -hmm. and I do I do something now uh, almost every time I'm in a cemetery. Uh, I'm doing math constantly. I, I'm really mm -hmm. good at it now. I look at headstones all the time, mm -hmm. and I look at I look at the years, and I I know you're not supposed to, right? You're supposed to look at the dash. According to the poem, right? You're supposed to look at the dash. It's not the years. And you don't, you know, look, it's, it's just, it's just, uh, I'm just telling you, this is just a reflection of my own thoughts on mortality. As I look at those ages and I'm like, I go, oh, that person lived, you know, 72. This person lived to be 98. This person, lived, you know, I look, oh, that got, that person got to 100. Wonderful. And I don't know these people. These, that's, see, that's, you know, you say that's wonderful. Like, I don't know these people. Maybe they didn't have a good life. I don't know. But I'm doing number games constantly as I'm going through the cemetery. And I notice myself looking at, at, at headstones and looking at dates now. Uh -huh. uh, I, I mean, I, to some extent, I, I, I hope I get out of that. Um, because it is, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, it, it isn't the important question, but it is part of thinking about your mortality and, um, the human being, the human beings are the only species that we know of that contemplates our mortality. We don't, we don't believe, and we don't know for certain, but we don't believe that animals have that ability or have that concern or even want to have that concern of their own mortality. And it gets back to the beginning of Genesis when we read about the, the tree of life, right? The tree of uh -huh. life, the knowledge of good and evil. Is, right. it, is it really what happens when we leave the garden is that we have more than anything, a sense of our own mortality. I mean, God says you will surely die. But does that mean that they weren't going to die before? I mean, some people interpret that literally. Or... Would, it, would Adam and Eve and all of the descendants that would have come off of Adam and Eve up until that point never have had a sense of their own mortality? And would they have been essentially then any different than the other animals in the garden? Any of the other animals in the world? Would we have ever left the garden? Would we have had to leave the garden? So I maybe there would have been no people. So, so that's the... Uh, the interesting question, or maybe there would have been two people still. All right. So now we continue because Jacob goes, Jacob bade, bade farewell, fair, uh, Pharaoh farewell. That's a tough one. Pharaoh farewell. Try saying that 10 times fast. <laughs> Pharaoh, Pharaoh farewell and left Pharaoh's presence. Um, what's the translation of the King James, by the way, of verse 10? And Jacob blessed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everybody sees that. It says "Vayivarech Yaakov et Vara. That so look, this translation, the JPS translation, wanted to go with more, with a less literal translation to some extent, which was, he just said goodbye to him. But that's not what the text says. The text actually says he blessed him. Now maybe in those days, again, saying goodbye was essentially saying, you know. 
Shalom, you know, Shalom Aleichem, be, you know, peace to you. That could have been the blessing. But it does say the word bless. You, ever, you all see that. That, he, that he, he, he didn't just say goodbye. He, he blessed him maybe too. And so he leaves Pharaoh's presence, which seems to be a permanent situation. That Pharaoh and Jacob are not going to interact with each other. What I find interesting about this is that, to some extent, Joseph has two role models and two people that he looks up to. One of them is his boss, Pharaoh, and the other is his dad, Jacob. And I will posit, or at least throw out there, um, that Joseph actually spends more time with his boss than he does with his dad, which, by the way, is not uncommon in life. But his real mentor is actually not his father. His real mentor is Pharaoh. And so when Jacob, yes, but Jacob, but, but Jacob, to some extent, when he says goodbye to Pharaoh here, he's also going to say goodbye to Joseph. And it doesn't say that exactly. But in the next line, it says, so Joseph settled his father and his brothers, giving them holdings in the choicest part of the land of Egypt in the region of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded, which is not what it says before that, which is that they're settled in Goshen. Here mm -hmm. it's going to be that they're settled here in the good part of different author. Possibly, very likely a different author. But what's interesting about the way that the Torah presents it is that wherever Jacob is living, it's not near Joseph. And that Joseph, interestingly enough, settles his father and brothers. And there's the word Yoshev, which by the way, in Hebrew is a little bit of a tongue, tongue twister. Yoshev, Yosef. Yoshev, <laughs> Yosef, yeah. Uh, but here it's interesting because it says that he settled them, which is the other word for that's not Gur. You know, it's interesting because we do say in modern Hebrew, Gur means where do you live? But Yoshev, and we don't usually wear the Yosh, word Yoshev, but Yoshev literally means settled more permanently. Right? It's where do you dwell? Where do you, where's, what's your address? So there seems to be this sense that Joseph settled in there, even if they didn't want to be settled there, even if they didn't intend to have a permanent address, he put him in a home. And I don't mean like literally like a convalescent home, a home, a home for somebody, but he also puts his brothers there too but he put them in a place where they were not going to live their nomadic life at least in this author or in this version that we have here now look we'll, we'll, we'll get to how the rabbis were rectify this and to some extent it's it's rectified and it's 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 uh the answer comes within the text but it seems that joseph has an attitude that he is going to put his brothers into a situation where maybe they're, they're not nomads anymore. That they're not doing the kinds of things that the Egyptians don't really like, which is that they look down on people that are, that are nomads. That they look down on those people that are shepherds. Mm -hmm. And so here's what it says. Joseph sustained his father and his brothers and all his father's household with bread down to the little ones. Well, that's nice. I mean, glad he took care of the kids. That's pretty, but that's pretty important. But what's interesting here is at least the way this is presented here is that Joseph took care of them. So, as, so if he's taking away their nomadic lifestyle, he essentially puts them, and we made this comparison, it's the Beverly Hillbillies, that he's putting them up and he's taking care of them now, which is not necessarily what they wanted, not necessarily the way they lived before. But now Joseph has decided that's the way they're living. And maybe they didn't like that. Maybe that's just what Joseph wanted because he did not want to be embarrassed by his family. But what, the, what comes with that is definitely this idea that he has to now provide for them because they can't provide for themselves. They're not going to have a livelihood. So now they get taken care of. Not a necessarily, and I'm sure some of you are thinking that's not so bad. It's not, not, that's kind of nice, you know, they get to leave the, the rough, the rough uh, life of a, of, a, of a shepherd, of a farmer, of somebody who has to live off the land, and now they get to live in a, 
high rise penthouse apartment. That's <laughs> what happens to the livestock? I guess they'd die, right? The livestock would be sold off. They would be, that would be uh, not sustainable. They leave, maybe they give it to somebody else, some other they people. Brought they, brought they brought it with them. It says they brought it with them. So uh, they would have to not have that anymore. Now, this is not the question that we have in front of us. This is not the question that's really posed to us here because the author here, and at least the way it's presented, is that this story, as much as we are asking, well, what, like, like Mike just said, what happened with all those sheep then? Where did they actually go? There's an interesting question here, which is that they're all getting taken care of with their food. But what's happening is this line. They're all getting bread. Lechem. It literally says bread. And then this is the line that comes right after. But there was, and I would say, but, but there was no bread in all the world. For the famine was very severe. Both the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. So the famine is going strong, at least, again, the way this is being presented, which is consistent. It's not like you have to say, well, it didn't say that. We knew there was a famine. This isn't going on in the background. But here it says the famine was really bad back in Canaan where they were, but that it's also bad in Egypt. Well, that makes sense if they're being affected by it. So even though they stored up all the wheat, all the grain, the famine's going on, which means the, they have the bread, they have the, the, the materials then to make bread, but it's a supply and demand issue. Whoa. Think about it. Prices are high. It's inflation. But what's really interesting, folks, and again, we can talk about it and think about it, where we are as a country, as a world right now, but you've seen the the warnings that that this bread, this uh, grain that would be coming out of Ukraine and Russia, but specifically Ukraine, if that stuff gets held up and doesn't get out of Ukraine, there could be millions of people that go hungry this summer. Mm -hmm. That's out there, folks. They've talked about it. Ukraine is a major produ producer of food of bread of of grain right and no matter what if, if ukraine is losing 100 uh men soldiers i mean we assume they're mostly men the, the, forgetting the civilians that are being killed but if ukraine is losing 100 able-bodied men a day in war you got to think some of those guys would have been farming even if they have factory farms even if they're doing the, what a lot of us do today which is you know get their food and don't think even because it's it's big farm factory farms I, I know they have those in ukraine but some of those people this war has got to be affecting the production not just the distribution not just the way this is going to get out of there but it's had to have affected the, the production so this is very very relevant to us right now so the famine was very severe and this is driving up prices and now we're going to be able to read this part, which we usually speed over when we're reading. This is a perfect example of a part that we, we speed over, but we have looked at this before. And I remember we've had a discussion about this very text right here, which is the economic impl implications of this. But most, most of the time, people don't read this. They don't pay attention to this because it's only a couple of lines. But look what the Torah tells us happens. The Torah actually delves and, and kind of gets a little bit into the economics of famine and economics of what happens with farms and with life during a famine. It says that Joseph gathered in all the money that was to be found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan as payment for the rations that were being procured. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's palace. And when the money gave out in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph, Joseph and said, give us bread lest we die before your very eyes, for the money is gone. And Joseph said, bring your livestock, and I will sell to you against your livestock if the money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for their horses, for their stocks of sheep and cattle and the asses. Thus he provided them with bread that year in exchange for all their livestock. Guess what? That's not the end. And when that year it was ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, 
We cannot hide from the my Lord that with all the money and all the animal stocks consigned to my Lord, there's nothing left at the Lord's disposal save our persons and our farmland. Guess what? They said, let us not perish before your eyes. Same words, right? Both we and our land. Take us and our land in exchange for bread. And we with our land will be serfs to Pharaoh. Provide the seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not become waste. So it says here that the Egyptians and the Canaanites came to Joseph and sold everything for food. So first they sold, they gave Joseph all and Pharaoh all the money, right? And when that got used up, they sold them all of their livestock. And that got them through another year. But the next year, they have to sell them their land. And they beg Joseph to buy it. And they say, look, you know, we're going to die otherwise. Now, what you just read is the Torah telling us that Joseph and Pharaoh wound up, if you will, I mean, they knew ahead of time what was going to happen. God told them to store up the food. They now have become essentially this global corporation that owns everything, everything. The land, the animals, the transportation, they own everything. Pharaoh, through Joseph now, they have everything. And the people have begged them to do it. It's not like they've taken advantage of them. They had the food. It doesn't say they marked it up. It doesn't say that they gouged them on the price. They, ha they had to live. They couldn't get food any other way. And so in order to live, they sell even their own land. So that, as we're going to see, the Pharaoh became the landowner. It doesn't say he was the landowner before. It implies that the people had private land ownership in Egypt, at least, before that. And also in Canaan, by the way, because it says it's happened in Canaan. Uh -huh. so again, it says right here. It, at first, Joseph, I, when, they, when they run out of money, Joseph says, bring me your livestock and I will sell it against your livestock. Money's gone. So Joseph at first says that to them. Um, the second time when they come back and they say, take our land, it's that they are the ones who say, take our land. Um, so the first time Joseph says, okay, fine. You don't have any money. I'll take your, I'll take your animals. Um, everybody get it so far? Everybody, everybody with us? We'll, yes. talk, we'll talk about this in a second. If you're like me, things are already turning around in your head. As you read about the Jews buying up all the property, buying up all the animals, the cars, and all that kind of stuff. So Joseph gained possession of all the farmland of Egypt for Pharaoh. All the Egyptians having sold their fields because the famine was too much for them. And thus the land passed over to Pharaoh. And he removed the population town by town from one end of Egypt's border to the other. Only the land of the priests did he not take over. For the priests had an allotment from Pharaoh. That, and they lived off that allotment which Pharaoh had made to them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. Now, here's the interesting part of this that we sometimes forget, too, is that after they take over the land, it says they actually took the people and got them off their land, except for the priests. Egyptian priests. Yeah. And this was the area, like we read about the city of On, where Potiphar comes from, where Joseph's father-in-law comes from. Priestly land was owned, uh, the priests had on essentially already been given to them by Pharaoh. So Pharaoh kind of owns that anyways. And they're supported by Pharaoh. So it doesn't affect the priests, but it basically says everyone else in Egypt got 
taken off their land. And so this doesn't, this isn't just, you know, this isn't just for the food, right? This is not just an economic policy that actually affects who owns the property and the nationalization of this property, which it is. This is nationalization of the property, right? It's the government taking over the property. And it happens when national, when, when countries nationalize property or industry, right? So if a government decides, you know what, the railroads or the oil, oil refineries are not owned by private individuals anymore, they're now owned by the government, then that's a scary thing. I mean, it's a scary thing for us as people who believe in generally democracy and capitalism and liberty and people having the right to own things. This kind of doesn't sit well with us because again, they had no choice. They had to sell it. That's not their, you know, but it seems like Pharaoh could have created a situation. Joseph and Pharaoh could have created a situation where the people still had some type of ownership of their land. They could work it, work back to get it. But instead, what this leads to is, is that Pharaoh, it says, removes the population town by town. So he actually takes the people off of their land and assumedly brings them into his cities and has them work for him. And he basically does whatever he wants with the property. Now, look, he knows the famine's still going on. He know, I mean, I'm only going to tell you what you have to remember. Pharaoh knows that there's a famine. He, he knows that. So we assume this is probably like four or five years into it already, right? Because, because, you know, we already had the year that Jacob and the kids, have, the brothers have come down. It's already a couple of years into it. This is another year goes by where, where the Egyptians are now dealing with it. Look, if it's two different authors, then you've got a different thing going on here too, somewhat, which is that, you know, maybe it's a year later, two years later. But we, we think this is pretty much towards the end. But Pharaoh actually does know. There's no sense in farming this land, at least for the next couple of years, because the famine, we're still in the famine, which means, you know, let's say Egypt is essentially sustained right, by the Nile River, which means if the Nile River is, is low, if the, if, the, if the level of the Nile is low, then they can't, they can't flood the channels and, and, and water the fields, which is the way the Egyptians ran their country for thousands of years. They would flood the, the areas where they grew grain, let the water kind of, you know, make the land wet and fertile. And then they would plant seeds and they would let the, the, the food grow. And then they occasionally would let in water right through the channels. They would bring in water and water the crops. And that's, that's the way they did it. They didn't need rain. So this isn't about rain, but it is about the water level for the Nile. So if the Nile further down, back all the way back down in, 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 in Africa, so, Southern Africa, is dealing with, with there's no water there, which again, it's, it's melt, melting. It is created by rain fall back down in Ethiopia and Sudan. What's happening is that Pharaoh knows there's no sense in planting for now. So get these people into the cities. They can work for me. I can get at least some value out of them. There's no sense. I'm not going to plant there. If I know there's not going to be anything growing there, why would I plant there? So Joseph and Pharaoh kind of know what they're doing. It's not like they're, they're, they don't know what they're doing, but the people still got moved off of their towns. He's destroying, he's, he's, he's reconfiguring the country. Now, did this happen? It seems like maybe it did happen that Egypt went through cycles of government control where the, where the Pharaoh would command people to build, you know, cities for him and those kind of things. We, we can see this. We read it in the Egyptian records and we can see it in the archeology. span But what's interesting about this is that this still does happen in the world. And, and governments come up with policies where they resettle people. Russia, the Soviet Union did it mm -hmm. for many years. Um, folks, China does it right now. China will literally decide we're building a city here. Everyone in the country, in the countryside, has to now come into the city that you have now. In this area, live in 
They don't have anybody a choice. And in some cases, as you may have known. We lost the rabbi. Can't hear you. Looks like we lost the rabbi. Yep. Rabbi's frozen. No sound. Yeah. We can what hear each phone? other. Yeah. He's not moving either. Yeah, he's frozen. Right, it's frozen. He want me to say. But we're moving. Yeah. Internet connection's unstable. Yeah. Can you hear us again? Oh, he's moving. Yeah. Okay. Something happened to our internet. Yep. Okay. So we're back on. Good. All right. Sorry, folks. That's so right. We were talking about, again, the fact that this does happen in our world. This, this has happened in China over the last 50 years. There's a policy that China had of bringing people into cities, urbanization. They wanted people in cities. They didn't want people in villages anymore. And so... Um, there are countries that do this, even in our own lifetime. And there's a, it happens in other countries too. And it also happens that countries decide to nationalize um, property and businesses. They did it in Russia. They did it in Cuba. They did it yes. in lots of countries. Well, we actually did it very briefly here in this country about 15 years ago, or not even 50, 12 years ago. The United States uh, government took over um, Washington Mutual Bank as it was going bankrupt, uh -huh. gave it to Chase. Um, that was a minor version of this, but it was an example of our government uh, deciding that they wanted to uh, get involved in that. Look, we did it, we, we, we've done it with, for the most part, it seems as most people have agreed with it. I don't know many people that, I mean, if you were a Washington Mutual shareholder, you didn't like what happened, but, um, generally speaking, because they, they got nothing. And it's been done also with eminent domain. They've taken over. Correct. It's done in change property. In eminent domain um, frequently in this country. Yes. Where the, government, where the government will basically say it's in our interest to take over right. this property so we can build a bridge or we can build a, do a street extension or we can build a stadium, right? Right. Uh, so that happens. And um, the other time it, it happened in our country was essentially when... Um, when Amtrak was founded, and so when the when the when our when we kind of nationalized our our train system, we used to have a system where individuals, companies owned uh, trail lines, and uh, you know train lines were were owned by the these different companies, and you know we nationalized and kind of combined train systems as people stopped using trains for passenger travel as much, and we created Amtrak, which again some people say was a, an abuse of, of the government. Other people say that if we hadn't done it, there would be a no passenger rail system in our country. Um, but clearly people- but We're still paying for it over and over and over again. I was gonna say, we, we're still paying for it. So somebody felt, uh, or some people feel, because it's been subsidized by uh, administrations, uh, by Congress from all parties for the last- right. 50 years now. So uh, whatever we want to say about it, it's happened and it's happened in our country. It's not at the same level. And again, this is an extreme version of it, but it is an interesting thing that the Torah tells us, which is that we had a takeover, a government uh -huh. takeover of people's property. Right. I would say that even though Joseph is the advisor and is the participant in it, I think it kind of asks an interesting question. Is this a good thing? Well, let's take a look at how this plays out. We're almost done. Joseph said to the people, whereas I have this day acquired you and your land for Pharaoh, here is seed for you to sow the land. And when the harvest comes, you will give one fifth to Pharaoh, four fifths shall be yours as seed for, your, for the fields and as food for you and those in your households and as nourishment for your children. And they have said, you saved our lives. We were grateful to my Lord and we shall be serfs for Pharaoh. And Joseph made it into a, law, a land law in Egypt, which is still valid that a fifth should be Pharaoh's. Only the land of the priests did not become Pharaoh's. And so this is an explanation that the Torah gives us 
for how Pharaoh and how Egypt still essentially taxes their people at 20%, which by the way, by our standards would be kind of low. It's a marginal <laughs> tax rate. We would take 20% and go, thank God, I'm only paying 20% in taxes this year. Uh, but, you know, look, it's 20% of, of what they, what they right. uh, would harvest. So it's an explanation for how Pharaoh wound up with this, which at least according to the Torah is because of Joseph. What's interesting about this, of course, is that the people say, thank you, Joseph. You saved our lives. We're grateful, right? We'll be serfs to Pharaoh. It doesn't say we'll be serfs to, to you. It says we'll be serfs to Pharaoh. Whatever. The point is, is that there's a lot going on here. Because again, it resonates with us. It tells us, first of all, that there is a historical fact, at least in the time of the Torah, at least in the time that this was written, that the Egyptians taxed their farmers 20%. It's the law of the land, which is still valid. Ad Hayom, which again, Mary probably says to this day, right? Uh-huh. Is that the translation, Mary? Ad Hayom in 26. Unto this day is what the King James says. So the Torah is explaining how this became a law. Okay, fine. But they're obviously saying more. But, but I mean, but that's part of why we have the story is that this is what happened. And again, not the land of the priests. That's different. That's not taxed like that. They have a, they have a, they have a tax, they're a tax exempt organization. The pharaohs of Egypt are <laughs> Priests of Egypt are a tax exempt organization, just like us. They're a 501c3. 501c3, they're religious. <laughs> so we have that. But what's interesting about this, of course, is that uh, this is a system that the Egyptians uh, institute, according to the Torah, because of a Jewish guy. There was a Jewish guy named Joseph. All our fault. Yes. So uh, what's interesting, of course, is that the people thank Joseph. You saved our lives. And again, he tells them now you can plant, which assumes that, by the way, that as they came to the end of this, that now is the time to plant. You can go back and plant. You're going to, um, you're going to plant. Um, and um, there seem, this story seems to be telling us that to some extent, Joseph is a hero. Mm-hmm. But it also, if you will, plants the seeds, right? That the people to some extent become slaves to Pharaoh. Now the translation here in the Bible that we just read here is the hyenu avadim le Pharaoh. <laughs> now for those who know Hebrew a little bit, what's the translation, Mary, of hyenu avadim le Pharaoh? In 25. We will be Pharaoh's servants, which is another nice way of translating it. But when we say avadim chayinu le Pharaoh, which we say every year at Passover, we don't translate it as we were their servants. We were their serfs. What do we say? We were their slaves. That's what it just said. The chayinu avadim le Pharaoh. The Egyptians become slaves to Pharaoh because of Joseph. So there's an interesting question here, folks. Yeah. Is there a karmic payback? Is there a feeling that Egyptians have when they finally get the Israelites under their control that they've now turned the tables on Joseph's family? Mm-hmm. You never thought about that before. No, because I you never probably did. didn't know that the Torah says that the Egyptians just became slaves to Pharaoh. It's the same words. The hyenu avadim le Pharaoh. Avadim hyenu le Pharaoh. Translated it like that? They translated it because the implication is that they're not slaves, that they still get to be normal Egyptians. But that's clearly not the point of the Torah. The point of the Torah, by using the same words, it's supposed to resonate with us. At the very least, even if the words can be understood differently, 
I mean, we do that all the time. We, we play off of words that we, mm-hmm. we know that we don't mean exactly the same when we say them in that context, but we use them as, as a way of kind of, well, maybe, it, maybe it is. And so there's this weird thing that happens here, which is that, again, we wouldn't catch this if we were reading it really fast, that the Pharaoh is now the master of the Egyptian people through mm-hmm. the work that Joseph just laid out. And of course, what this does for us is also gives us a very clear sense that what we have here in this story that we just read, one of the earliest, earliest possible justifications for anti-Semitism that we talk about, Mm -hmm. which is the economic role that some people will perceive as the justification for anti-Semitism, right? For hating Jews. The, the justification for it, right? Which is that, yeah, well, you know, the Jews own everything. This is at least hinted at by here, if not stated, which mm-hmm. is part of this takeover. And did people resent the Jews who were in ownership positions now of, of Egypt? Because Joseph is definitely part of this. It says that Joseph, it says that. It says it's, this isn't, this doesn't even say this is Pharaoh's idea. It says Joseph said to the people. Right. So Joseph is not shy about telling the people. And he doesn't say you're my slaves. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say Pharaoh. He doesn't say I own your land. He says Pharaoh owns your land. So he's right. definitely not, he's not claiming that it's his. He doesn't even, he doesn't do that. But he is the face of this economic program. And so it, it really does kind of give us a weird sense of yeah i've seen this before on the other hand if he had not done what he did after seven years of famine they'd all be dead well of course right yeah um well i do i since we have the ability to to uh um since i want to uh the the broader concept yeah but but do we not understand that uh, do we not understand that that this concept of Jews being involved in 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 um, keeping people economically disenfranchised yes. still is a part of of um, history. Look, it I'm, is. I'm going to share with you an example of this right now. 1927. How long ago was that? Just under 100 years ago in this country. There's a wonderful uh, poem. Um, There's a wonderful poem that I'm going to share with you, uh, which is from one of the most well-known poets in American history, uh, at least of the last 100 years. So here's the, here's the poem, and it's actually a title of the book of poems, um, January 1st, 1927. Where's the, where's the text? Hold, hold, hold it one second. Uh, some of you might know what I'm about to share, but I thought I had it already up here. Um, this is considered, this is considered one of the, classics of of um this is considered one of the classics of american poetry it's tough because we can, it can't actually even be read now because people um because people um have a difficulty acknowledging this poem oh man i, I don't it's hard to to show up because uh I can't um, hold it one second. Yeah, they, they definitely work at trying to make sure that. Who's you, the author? Well, I'm going to show it to you. I don't want to. I, I want you to. I want you to see it. Um, Cause. Uh, um, hold it one second. Yeah, it's a collection of poetry. And it was widely criticized, but I will show you right now. Um, sometimes it's listed under a different title. 
Um, uh, no, hold it, hold it, hold it. Um, okay, here is, yeah, because it's listed under, here's the poem. Here you go. You just pop it up right now. Because the poem is actually called Hard Luck. But the collection of poems is actually from uh, the title of the, of the collection is Fine Clothes to the Jew. And it is written by, I'll show you when we're done. Well, you can see it at the top. Langston Hughes, considered one of the fathers of the Harlem Renaissance. When hard luck overtakes you, nothing for you to do. When hard luck overtakes you, nothing for you to do. Gather up your fine clothes, your fine clothes, and sell them to the Jew. Jew takes your fine clothes, gives you half a, a dollar and a half. Jew takes your fine clothes, gives you a dollar and a half. Go to the bootlegs, get some gin, and make you laugh. The last lines, if I was a mule, I'd get me a wagon to haul. If I was a mule, I'd get me a wagon to haul. I'm so low down, I ain't even got a soul. That's the poem. So that's a poem that they used to teach in school, used to read it because Langston Hughes was considered one of the classic American poets. Um, but the trope, the, the, the message of his poem was that in his community, the, 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 it, he didn't even have to explain it that people would go to the Jewish pawnbroker and sell their clothes to the pawnbroker. They'd sell their clothes. And if you read what he said you, they did with it, they'd go out and buy alcohol with it. Now, there's a lot going on in that poem. And I will tell you, it's not so simple to just say he doesn't like the Jewish pawnbroker. Okay, because clearly, He's also not speaking very highly for the fact that the people who are selling their clothes are then going out and buying alcohol with it. There's a sadness to it. Obviously, this poem's called Hard Luck. And this poem from 1927, 1927, shows the feeling that was brewing, at least within the African American community during the Harlem Renaissance already, We're talking about 100 years ago where the feeling was is that Jews were taking advantage economically of the African-American community. Now, again, here we're talking about two minority communities in the United States, uh -huh. but has anybody seen that poem before? I'm like, am I just- I, I have just... never seen it. Yeah, so- No, I haven't either. I have a question, though. What would they have done if there hadn't been a Jewish pawnbroker to sell their clothes to? That's, of course, at least that's the question. That's where we get to the Egyptians thanking Joseph and saying, thank God for you, right? You know, if we had been for you, we wouldn't have any food at all. So there is that, there is that question, right? You know, what if there hadn't been the Jewish pawnbroker uh, to do this? And, and again, they say, you've saved our lives. We are grateful to my Lord. And by the way, of course, they call him Adoni, which is my Lord. It's not the God name for God, but it is the way we say God, Adonai, uh, my Lord. So, um, yeah, I mean, if they weren't there, then, then that would happen. Now, I will tell you this. This concept, if I talk to Jewish kids today, and I talk to Jewish kids about American Jewish history, it's one of the things I teach. When I talk to kids today about the concept of the Jewish pawnbroker, the Jewish merchant that was working in some of these areas, they have no idea what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It was their grandparents, really not their grandparents, it was their great grandparents and their great great grandparents now. So they don't really understand what I'm talking about here. This is not something that they even, they don't even know about these stories. But there were a lot of people who were doing this in the Jewish community, where in almost every city in America, where there were Jewish folks that were running those stores, whether they were a pawn shop or whether they were the candy store, or the, the, the pharmacy, um, that they were running these stores in, in, in fairly impoverished areas. Uh -huh. 
in almost every city in America. I don't care if it was New York, Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, almost every one of these stores, the Jewish family ran the local pharmacy and the parents, the parents and the kids lived up, up, up on the second floor and the, and the candy shop, the, the pharmacy was on the ground floor all across the country. But again, we're talking about the 20s and 30s and 40s, right? A lot of these, a lot of those families transitioned out of that. Look, it's today why you've got Indians and Pakistanis and Arabs that are running 7-Elevens. These are jobs people don't want to have. They don't want to be up at two o'clock in the morning selling a Slurpee. But that was us. In the 1920s and 30s, that was, that, that, that was us. It was not a great job. It was not a job that people wanted to have. And guess what? Their kids generally didn't do it. They sold those stores. They got out of that. They got out of that stuff because they didn't want to do it. It wasn't that they wanted to do it. They had to do it. In some cases, it was the only jobs that they could have. Nobody wanted a Jewish doctor. They didn't want a Jewish lawyer. You didn't, couldn't go to colleges in the 1920s and 30s. That's when they started creating a quota system. So it's not like people wanted to have those jobs in the Jewish community. So you're right. Well, where, who's going to do it? It was not an easy time. Now, again, it's not, it, I'm not, it was not as bad as it was for their brothers and sisters and cousins and, and aunts and uncles that were living in Germany in 1934 and 35 when the Nazis took over there or the Soviet Union, you know, decided to purge Jews in the 1930s and 40s during the time of Stalin. But, but this is not easy here. By the way, I want to tell you something that I've noticed. And again, I know this was bad. I know it was bad for people because I've done several funerals lately for people that are now they're there in their eight in their nineties, eighties and nineties, whose parents were running these kinds of stores. Cause I always like to ask, you know, where did the kid, where did your mom or dad or grandparent, where did they grow up? And all the time, you know, five or six times a year, I'll get a story of that guy that whose dad ran the pharmacy the drugstore, the, the, the local drugstore, the, the, the pawn shop, and they ran that store and they, that's where the kid grew up. Buffalo, I don't care. It's ever, like, I, they, you know, that was what people did. A lot of people. And I want to tell you, a lot of these stories, a lot of these stories, and I'm not telling you something because I want you to like be mad or angry about it or sad about it. But a lot of these stories, my grandfather got shot killed a lot of these stories where my grand my mother grew up without a dad because her dad got killed in the in the store they held up my father three times and and they took him three times and and they brought back his safe every single time yeah <laughs> so joanne just said her father got held up three times um listen this is real stuff. I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you other than I've seen it happen so often now that it's like I hear the story and I go, I know that story. I know that story. So. Um, they also let him keep his ring that his mother gave him. Wow. So and it was gold. if you heard Joanne, yeah. Joanne said they got they let him keep his ring, his yeah. the ring that his mom. Look, I, I, uh, I will tell you that this was part of what why people didn't pass those jobs on to their, to their families, because it was dangerous. They didn't, they, they didn't, you know, yeah. Thank God Joanne's dad survived three holdups, but you know, they did it in broad daylight. Listen, my grandfather ran a general, ran a, a, a surplus store in, in East LA on Broadway, which is now Cesar Chavez, the street that he ran it. It was right near Boyle Heights. He ran a he ran a, 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 a army navy surplus store. Uh, you know, people bought stuff that was in the fifties, and the surplus store was there for thirty years on Broadway. And my my dad was traveling once. He was in uh, Chicago, or I think it was Chicago. He was talking with a cab driver, and the cab you know, they started talking, and he said to the cab driver, "Where'd you grow up?" or whatever. And the cab driver says, "I grew up in East LA." He says, oh, my dad had a store in East LA. He had a, a store on Broadway, an army surplus store. He goes, the guy, the cab driver says, oh my gosh, when we were kids, we used to break into that store all the time. 
Oh, God. So they started laughing. He goes, really? He goes, yeah. He says the, and he says the, the combination for the safe was written right underneath the mat. You know, <laughs> like over by, it's like, it's like the guy knew. It wasn't like he didn't know. He knew exactly what he was talking about with my dad. And, and yeah, this is why my dad didn't go into the, to the business because, you know, these kinds of things would happen. You know, my dad, my grandpa would come home and say, you know, they got a, a safe got robbed again. I don't know that my, I don't know how many times his place got robbed while he was there, but uh, it did happen. And, and um, this was what people did. Uh, and they just, they, they didn't have a choice. So this was a part of American Jewish history. And so when I read this text and I read about Joseph and, and, and um, what kind of feelings this might have generated, it's very possible, folks, that this plants the seed of why the Egyptians so easily turned on the Jews mm-hmm. a generation or two later, when a new pharaoh arose who didn't know Joseph, who didn't care about Joseph, and 100% this is what happened in Germany in the 1930s, because the resentment towards Jews who had either gotten rich or who had survived World War I with money allowed Hitler to take over all those businesses that were owned by Jews during the Weimar Republic up through the 20s and 30s, mm-hmm. take away those businesses, take away the homes, take away the property from Jewish businessmen who had done well during that period of time. Now, a lot of them did terrible during the depression the great depression destroyed a lot of german families wealth but if they had wealth still when it was all over there were a lot of average germans who didn't have wealth and 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 had nothing who when they had a chance to say oh let's take the jewish property you need a lot of you need a lot of prodding when they got to say hey look you know we'll give you this store to run we'll give you this business to run because we're taking it away from the, the Liebermans or we're taking it away from whoever else. We're taking away this department store. You know, we talked about Margot's family, you know, that they owned a department store in, in, in Halle in Germany. They just, the government just took it over. They said, it's not yours anymore. It, we, you've owned it for three generations. You made it through the depression. It doesn't matter. It's ours now. All the, all the goods in it, they're ours now. That happened. It happened less than 100 years ago. It happened during some of our lifetimes where people just literally lost everything in a, in a night. And, and when they, and people say, well, how did the Germans let it happen? Well, because they liked it to happen. It meant that they didn't have to work. And someone literally turned over three generations of accumulated wealth and hard work and, and sacrifice and just gave it to somebody. So, yeah, it's tough to put a price tag on that. I mean, Margot got reparations, but not nearly what three generations of accumulated effort and, 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 and risk and, and heartache and all those things that go into running a business, they were taken away in an instant from her grandfather. And her parents never enjoyed those reparations during their lifetimes because they died before they ever saw a cent of it. So I think her mom was alive when the reparations came, but... Um, you're talking about those reparations came 20 or 30 years later. 30 years later, 40 years later. So um, this happened. The story of, of Joseph and Egypt happened very much so in the story of Germany in the 30s and 40s. And it's interesting to think what would have happened in the United States if the United States had seen a rise in anti-Semitism, a real, I mean, it did, but if it had seen a, a takeover, which is kind of the premise for, uh, for uh, that series that we did, uh, they did uh, a couple of years ago based on Philip Roth's book. I can't remember now. Somebody tell me what that was called. I don't remember. Anyways, uh, what would have happened in an alternate history where America would have been taken over or the leadership had become also anti-Semitic and anti, uh, you know, pro, pro-Nazi, whether there would have Jews, whether Jews would have seen their property taken away, whether Jews, Jewish businesses would have been 
taken away uh, in the same way that they were done there by people who said, well, look at Bernard Baruch and all these other people who are running the economy for the United States during World War I that made money during World War I and, and the years after. Let's just take away their property. Could have happened. I mean, thankfully, it didn't, but it could. I mean, we wonder if it, if it could have. People are still getting artwork back from the church. Yep, artwork is still being returned. Yes. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, again, whatever the, the economic value is of this stuff, it's difficult to think of anybody who's built a business, and especially a business that's taken three or four generations to build, and then to have it taken away. What's the value of your grandfather, great grandfather's hard work? Um, what's the value of that sacrifice that they made to mm -hmm. keep a business afloat? And but they were all murdered. So I guess at the end of the day, you know, for the people who survived, that was the least of their concerns at the time. Right. But it is it is another aspect of this that we don't think about a lot and was another part of the tragedy of, of what happened to people during, during that war. So um, that's how Pharaoh wound up with this. So let's finish up this chapter. As I told you, we're looking at this a little bit more in depth than we normally do. So, um, <laughs> and Israel in the last line, we didn't read this last line. Israel settled in the country of Egypt, in the region of Goshen. They acquired holdings in it and were fertile and increased greatly. And so what's interesting about this is the last line seems to say that Israel was living in Goshen and not in, um, and not in the area of Ramses. And so what happens here is it's either a different author, but this yeah, is a different place. What? He also called them Israel. Muslims. Yes. And so here, as Mike points out, the giveaway here might be is by Yeshev Yisrael, that Israel settles, which again uses the word Vayeshev and not Gur, is not, is not a, it's not a, a temporary nomadic sojourn, but a Yoshev. But as again, as we looked at here, when, uh, when we read about Joseph um, and Jacob here, it, he's called Yaakov, Ayavarech Yaakov. So the next line says that he settled in the region of Ramses, as Pharaoh's commanded him, and the choice is part of the, of, of the land of Egypt. And here at the end, it says, Israel settled in the land of, in the country of Egypt, in the region of Goshen. They acquired holdings in it and were fertile and increased greatly. So here, it's a different area. It's a different name for, for, for Jacob. And so it's a different area. It says Goshen, which is where we read about them when, they, when we see them in, in the next book. And we also have this phrase, which is very important in the next book of the Torah. Vayifru vayirbu. Meod. They increased and were fertile. Mm -hmm the Israelites, because that's what we read about at the very beginning of Exodus, that the people increased and multiplied. And of course, we read that at Passover. That this is what made the Egyptians crazy, is that they increased and multiplied. Now, what's interesting is it says they increased and multiplied here. Even in Genesis, it uses that word. So it does not seem to have freaked out the Egyptians yet, but it does in the book of Exodus. At the very beginning of Exodus, it says the Egyptians were upset about it. So, look, there's a possibility that they lived in that part of Egypt, and then they moved to the land of Goshen. That is a possibility. That's the way the rabbis want to have it, is that they moved. They settled in Goshen after they lived in that part of Egypt. Um, it's also a possibility that there's two different places that two different authors give us for where they lived. So do we know where Ramses is? That was Mike's question. Do we know where it is? Uh, we know some possibilities of where Ramses is because we read that 
later on that Israelites built Pitom and Ramses. But it seems as though that, that Pitom and Ramses that they built maybe was not the Ramses where they were before. Because it, it could very easily be a different place, the Ramses that was built in the land of Goshen. So it doesn't have to be the same place. It could be, but it also could be that Ramses, being the name of several pharaohs, is a place that they build up in their area of Goshen, just as like there was a, a Ramses over there in the in closer to the land there. So if Ramses is the area that we're thinking it was, the other part, not the area of Goshen, Goshen seems to be a little bit closer to the land of Israel, a little bit closer to Canaan is where Goshen is. So maybe on the other side of the Nile, maybe even on the other side of the Red Sea, which is an interesting question, because if they didn't cross the Red Sea, what area did they cross when they crossed over? But if Goshen is closer into the Sinai, then they didn't cross that part of the Red Sea, which leads some people to say maybe they crossed the Red Sea closer to Jordan, which is one theory, because if they're in Goshen, then they're already not on that side of the Red Sea. Because remember, the Red Sea comes around the bottom of Egypt and then back up the other side of Egypt, uh -huh. Jordan. So if, if it's not that Red Sea, then maybe it's a different part of the Red Sea, or maybe it's a whole different body of water altogether. But if they start out from the land of Goshen, it also means that they're not starting out right from the area of the Nile, which is where some of the miracles seem to happen. So this is important because the miracles seem to happen, some of them by the Nile, and some of them in the land of Goshen. So it does seem like we, we do that. Now, without freaking you out further, and we'll get to it when we get into the book of Exodus, which we will, it is very possible. It's very possible that there are two versions of the 10 plagues. And that the whole concept of 10 plagues is something that we kind of added up later by the way that the Torah lays it out. So without freaking you out too much, it is possible that there are two different lists of plagues. One set of plagues that seem to happen around the Nile and another set of plagues that happen where the Israelites live and have a slightly different effect. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but there does seem to be a few different things going on in the plagues. I will tell you that. Sometimes God is mentioned in the plagues. Uh, sometimes Aaron's mentioned in the plagues. Sometimes Moses is mentioned in the plagues. There's differences in the way the plagues are presented. Also, how they're presented, we'll get into that more soon. But there does seem to be this idea that maybe even where it happened, where were the Israelites living when these plagues took place? Where was Moses? Because Moses seems to have been in the Nile River. He seems to have been really close to the Pharaoh when he was born. So are the Israelites in Goshen? Pharaoh's not in Goshen. That we do know. Pharaoh doesn't live in Goshen. So if, if Moses, which we'll look at soon, in chapter two of Exodus is by the Nile River, then he's not living in, his family's not living in Goshen. So it's also possible that maybe not all the Israelites lived in Goshen. Maybe some of them lived in Egypt uh, proper in the big cities in modern day area of like Cairo, or maybe some of them lived out in the country. It's possible. There were a lot of them. They multiplied greatly. But the idea that they're all living in Goshen they are in Goshen, does seem to be part of the Torah as well. But we'll look at it. So keep that in mind when we get through and start talking about Goshen. Um, we, we're, we're not going to skip ahead, but we will tell, we will remind you, there's Goshen right there. And again, this isn't the first time we've read about it, because it said earlier, right? It said earlier that they are, uh, they're now in the region of Goshen. So there's a part. There's a place in New York called Goshen, by the way, too. It's in it's in, uh, it's in Orange County. It's not there. <laughs> it's definitely named after that. But yeah, this is the area that we live in. Was Goshen? Uh, is it a good place to live? I don't know. It seems to be. It seems to be at least a place where he can, where Joseph can keep his family out of trouble. I like that idea. That it's a place where they can keep him out of trouble. So, uh, actually, this is a good place for us to break because next week. Um, We'll read about his final blessings. So we'll, we'll read chapter. This is the last part of chapter 48. Uh, 
I thought maybe we'd read the Ephraim and Menashe story, but it really is good to read the Ephraim and Menashe story with the blessings that he gives to his sons. So he gives a blessing, I'm not going to ruin it, come back next week. But I will tell you this, Jacob blesses his grandchildren, Ephraim and Menashe, and he blesses his children. But he blesses the grandchildren first. He blesses at least Ephraim and Menashe separately first. And then we read about the blessing that he has for his kids, which in some cases seems more like a curse than a blessing. But you have to come back next week if you want to hear the blessings uh, of, of Jacob, the blessings for his grandsons and for his sons. So that'll be the theme for next week. This was the theme today was the economic policy of Joseph and Pharaoh and how timeless it is. Because my guess, folks, is as long as there are Jewish people, and as long as some Jewish people succeed economically, there will be people who will be anti-Semitic. It doesn't take a lot for me to make that prediction. Mm -mm. But my guess is we're not going to, that's not going to come to an end. And uh, it's sad. It's sad that that's pervasive. That's a pervasive side of of uh human nature but man doesn't seem like any other group of people in the west in america and europe get blamed for economic misfortune more than the jewish people i know by the way in some countries especially like in you know malaysia or vietnam or other parts of asia that the chinese are oftentimes seen that way they're good business people or they're, you know, they run the stores and things like that. And there are, there are other countries where there's minorities that have taken on economic power, the Indian community in uh, the, uh, from East India and Pakistan, I say Indian, but India, you know, from India in uh, mm-hmm. places like Trinidad and the Caribbean. And he also in Fiji where the Indian population is almost 50% of the country. And there have been Indian prime ministers of Fiji that have, um, there have been civil wars over that between uh, Fijians, native Fijians and the Indians. So it's not always, there are other countries where there's other people that are blamed for, for economic problems and disparities and control and monopolies and things like that. But at least in our country, and at least in uh, much of the, the um, Europe, the places where our, obviously where our families lived, Russia, the Jews oftentimes get blamed for economic imbalance. So, um, look, as long as there are there we Jewish businesses, Jewish owned businesses or businesses owned by Jewish people, you're going to hear that. So, uh, I don't know. You have to talk. I don't know what to say. I'd like to end on a happier note, which is that. They're, they're gonna. We won't. All, there won't. This won't always happen. But uh, I will say that uh, I don't pray for us not to be successful in order for anti-Semitism to stop. So if, if, if part and parcel of it is that we become economically not successful, that's not something that I uh, I'm looking for. Right. And I think they'll find they'll people will find reasons to hate Jews no matter what. So that's the that's the problem. Mike, you didn't want to tell me the score of the game. Obviously, I saw it. It's too late. We're gonna get swept, we're gonna get swept by Pittsburgh. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. Worst, worst teams in baseball. Yes. Anyways, everyone, to thank everybody. We're finishing up tonight. Uh, on a happy note. That's not a happy note. They're losing eight yeah, to two. Good game was ended. Anyways, we're, we're still good. learning every day, and that's a happy note. Yes, it's good to see y'all, and uh, we'll see you Friday night services with Wendy, and again Shavuot seven o'clock here at the synagogue. So we can wish you a Chag Sameach. Uh, Mike's going to share with us. Everybody, come with us uh, on this journey. Thank you. Thank, you. thank, thank you. you, Rabbi. Thank you. Good night, and thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. And everybody, take care. Bless you. Take care.